person in this room with 72 hours notice and a sufficient supply of caffeine could write an outstanding quantum proposal. Um, however, um, and probably some of you have done that, um, but you know, when you actually start trying to go after the 10 million, the 20 million, the 50 million, the five investigator, the 10 investigator, the 20 investigator, the two school, the five school, the 10 school kinds of things, it turns out you need the entire institutional platform to sort of behind you, and that there's just sort of a broader landscape of sort of connections and components and stuff, and one of the things that I'm happy to do is, is try to make the institution's um, resources available to provide some oomph um, in that direction. So I look forward to helping to provide some more oomph for the quantum stuff in the, in the future. Um, happy to welcome you all to three days of sort of everything quantum celebration, and I hope you have a great time here. Uh, my name is David Waldeck, and I'm in the chemistry department here at Pitt. Uh, we have three s s speakers this morning. Uh, the first speaker will be Natalia Berloff. She's in uh, applied math mathematics at Cambridge, uh, and she's very interested. But it's really the glory goes to the experimentalists who were able to realize this sometimes absolutely um, unsustainable or crazy ideas that theorists may have. So the work started with Jeremy Baumbeck and Nana Photonic Center in Cambridge in Cavendish, where for the first time we looked at the lattices creating polariton condensates in some simple geometries, creating them in the corners of equilateral triangles or squares, etc., and seeing how the coherence between these condensates is established. But the idea of using this platform for simulation, for solving hard optimization problems, um, took off with Pavlos Lagudakis first at Southampton lab, and then he moved um, actually part time to Skoltech to help to bring this activity to life. Uh, the idea that many people are playing in this field is that we would like to create a physical platform, a simulator, that somehow finds the global minimum of a complex optimization problem, but of a classical problem. So for instance, you can think of the NP-hard problem, classical computer, can only deal efficiently with the small size of the problem, so we're trying to create a physical platform that, of course, will also take an exponential number of steps to solve this problem, but will take it faster than von Neumann architecture. So this is the main idea. It's not about algorithmic to find in a polynomial solution for NP-hard problem. It's an attempt to do it faster than classical computer, still in exponential time, but if you do it faster, it means that you can solve problems of the higher dimension of the larger number of variables. And initially, this, uh, this uh, idea has been exploited within the context of equilibrium systems, and some of them are mentioned on this famous diagram, um, because the equilibrium system have well-defined Hamiltonian. So if you map your optimization problem into the Hamiltonian of the system, the system will be in, in the minimum of this Hamiltonian. But the problem is that the system, the equilibrium system, they typically end up at the local minimum rather than global minimum of this Hamiltonian. So instead, the focus has shifted to non-equilibrium systems. Non-equilibrium systems have control parameter, the gain, the forcing, the injection of the particles to bring the system to threshold. And as you rise this, uh, this control, the pumping, the gain uh, from below, the idea that something dramatic happens, for instance, the phase transition will happen at the global minimum of a Hamiltonian. 
And so in my talk, I will also I will talk about the Polariton simulator, but I will also discuss the requirements for any such non-equilibrium platform to become a global optimizer. So the outline of my talk, I start by introducing polaritons and polariton condensates um, and how to create the simulator from them. I will formulate the mathematical platform that describes the operation of the simulator using the coherent centers. The centers that have well-defined amplitude and phase, and they coupled uh, in such a way that the system minimizes uh, the underlying spin Hamiltonian. So I will formulate the requirement for such system to find the global minimum of the XY Hamiltonian. I will extend it to also cover Ising and the clock or uh, n planar Potts model. And also, I will touch upon polariton graphs to be a paradigm for the systems of coupled oscillators. And then we'll see what the new physics will come from the system. Uh, so the recent interest in these gain dissipative platforms, of course, you all know about uh, coherentizing machine, Yoshi Yamamoto, using the optical parametric oscillators and time multiplexing. Uh, Near Davidson from Weizmann used lasers in the cavities also for the purpose of minimizing the XY Hamiltonian. So we introduced our polariton graphs um, platform. And polaritons, half light, half matter particles, after that have been also uh, used in experiments on the trapped condensates in Jeremy Baumberg group and Hamid Ohadi group in St. Andrews. Polariton micropillars, where polaritons are created at the top of this uh, structured, lithographically structured micropillars, were also elucidated as a good candidate for topological insulators. And finally, photon condensates have been, um, there are attempts to use them also as, the, as, as, as such platform for minimizing the XY Hamiltonian. What is the common between all these systems is the element, the bit of this computer, of the simulator, is the phase the classical phase of the order parameter of the classical complex number associated with the state of the system that also has an amplitude. But these, these are the phases that are mapped into the spins of the corresponding Hamiltonian. OK, so what is the polariton? In our experiments, polaritons are created in semiconductor microcavities. Quantum wells are created by alternated gallium, uh, aluminum, indium, arsenic atoms of about 10, um, thickness of the 10 atoms um, in the quantum well, surrounded by Bragg mirrors, by reflectors. In this case, these structures are made in such a way that the light of a particular color, of particular frequency, can be trapped in this semiconductor microcavity. So as the laser is shined into the structure surrounded by the de Bragg uh, reflectors, the exciton gets, uh, the, gets created. Electron is excited, leaving a hole behind. And this electron hole pair, exciton, um, is an excited state of matter. So the exciton tends to spit out the photon. If the mirrors are in resonance with the, with the exciton, the photon gets reflected become excites exactly the same exciton, gets re-emitted, reabsorbed, and that creates a superposition of states called exciton polariton or polariton. So polariton is half light, half matter. It comes from hybridization of exciton and uh, photon, and therefore from the uh, dispersion relation of the photon in microcavity and the exciton comes the so-called lower polariton branch of and upper polariton branch. These are uh, light particles, so we can vary the proportion of the photonic and excitonic components, but the typical mass is 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5 of the mass of the electron, billion times lower than the mass of the atoms in ultra-cold BECs, for instance. These are strongly non-interacting non, non systems, and the main source of the interaction is through the electron exchange between the excitons. But the mirrors, the Bragg reflectors, are not perfect. So after bouncing back and forth, photon gets through these mirrors. Therefore, there is a short lifetime, the particular lifetime of the particles. In our experiments that I'm going to talk about, they're of the order of the 10 picoseconds. 
In spite of this such short lifetime, there are many balancing back and forth um, effects before, so we can talk about the thermalization of the system. But therefore, it's non-equilibrium system, and this is good and bad. This is also a blessing because the exciton, uh, because the photons, as they leak through the mirrors, they carry all the information about the state of the matter in the cavity. So in our experiments, the laser will be at the high energy creating the source of the, the free carriers, free particles that scatter, relax, emit phonons, and then condensed at the bottom of the lower polariton branch. And the photons being the continuation of the wave function of the condensate give us the information about the energy and momentum distribution, density distribution of the condensate in the semiconductor microcavity. The experiments that I will refer to are based on inorganic microcavities made of gallium arsenide and indium and aluminum atoms. However, also in hybrid photonics lab in Skoltek, we realized uh, the room temperature condensation using the polymers. It's called yellow body pi because it's an invisible part of the spectrum. It's actually yellow. Uh, an important thing to realize, so now uh, to create the condensate, so we have this two-dimensional plate or plane of where the excitons live, and we can use a spatial light modulator to create the condensates at a particular point, at a particular position on a two-dimensional plane. This is a two-stage process. So as we pump, so this is just a single pump, let's say with a Gaussian profile, first the hot exciton reservoir is created, a large hill of these hot particles that then scatter to create the condensate, but it's a non-equilibrium system. Because of the losses, to have a steady state, the laser should be continuously on, and that gives the non-equilibrium dynamics, so it gives the fluxes even at the steady state in the system. So the polaritonic particles spread from the point where they are crea created, and there is a characteristic velocity of their propagation this outflow wave vector Kc, which as you can see, quite important for, uh, for the coupling strands between the condensates. This outflow wave vector, wave number, is controlled by the pump geometry and the pumping intensity. Okay, so this is the system that we have in mind. And the story start, started um, uh, using the polariton lattices with a fully theoretical proposal we put with Jonathan Keeling from St. Andrews where we propose to create the condensates at the corners of equilateral triangle. And actually, we were interested in what happens in between. So clearly, if there is a coherence in the system established, then the density profile between the condensates is just the superposition between the wave functions coming from these three condensates. And then we propose to use a magnetic field to change these this structures. This is the vortex lattice of positive and negatively charged vortices. So that's what we thought is quite interesting. Um, it's this, this paper stayed in archive because the referee said, you know, it's just a theoretical proposal. The, it's not possible to implement experimentally. Uh, so we went, uh, we went to Jeremy Baumberg at that instance, and within two weeks of our conversation, he actually produced exactly what we predicted in our paper, and then it went into nature physics, et cetera, et cetera. So the only difference was that we proposed to pump in the thickness of about 10 microns, and he said it's easier for him to do one micron um, uh, con size of the condensate, but uh, the, the same vortex lattice has emerged. And then we looked also at two condensates pumping well above the threshold, and then we saw in the energy and the distance space, we saw so there are two pumps about two microns away from each other. The size of each pump uh, is about one micron, but the hot reservoir created the saddle in between, and what we observed is that there, there are the states of the quantum harmonic oscillator. So seen here on this picture on the, the size of 20 microns. So then we talked about seeing quantum mechanics with the naked eye. So 20 microns, so my hair being admittedly thin is about 80 microns. So it's already visible kind of part, part of the spectrum. So it could be, could be observed by the usual optical, optical uh, microscopes. But immediately after this results, the question was, but how do condensate decide 
on what is the rel relative phase between them. So in these experiments, we only observed in-phase configuration. So we understood that initially, as we start pumping at these three corners, the phase is random. And then the condensates grow, or this, the system grows until it becomes the condensate and until the full coherence is established. But what is this mechanism by which the condensates talk to each other and decide which phase difference to establish? So to analyze that, this is actually now the experiment, experiments that we done with Pavlos Lagudakis group in Southampton and then in Skoltek. So we explain this phenomenon by stimulated relaxation of the system. It's a bosonic stimulation. So the polaritons are created at the phase configuration that corresponds to the highest occupation. It's simply for the given pumping intensity, we ask the question, if we are at the threshold, if we pump at the threshold, only the configuration that allows for the condensation to take place, so the configuration for the maximum number of particles will be realized. So in other words, if we have these two condensates and now you see the cross section of them, to maximize the number of particles if they equally pumped, there are two possibilities, either they're in phase or with five phase difference. In this case, you have the maximum interference, uh, the, uh, the maximum of the standing wave between the two condensates. Here we have minimum. And the total number of particles is simply twice the density, the number of particles in these isolated condensates, if only one of them was pumped, plus the standing wave that can give you either pi or phase difference. So you can have the maximum number of particles corresponding to either that or that configuration. Or to extend in this argument mathematically, so the system is trying to maximize the total number of particles, so the square of the wave function of the condensate, that can be represented in the tight binding approximation as the sum of the wave functions of the individual localized condensates with taking into account individual phases with an extra factor. So if I now square this, expand this, I'll have n condensates. Each of them have the same number of particles. It's an isolated condensate. And then we have the cosine of the di phase difference between each condensate times the coupling strength, which is simply the integral of this cross product of the function and the, its con complex conjugate. So if we maximize in the number of particles, we, this is fixed, so we are minimizing, therefore, minus of this expression, which is the classical XY Hamiltonian. Okay. So, and this has been shown then in these experiments, when we fix the pumping intensity, so we fix the outflow velocity with which polaritons spread from the position where they are created, and now change the distance. So this is about three and a half microns, uh, and then we start increasing, and you can see by the minimum, so this is the density profile of two condensates. We have minimum here, so they're in pi phase difference configuration. Then it's a maximum, so they're in phase configuration. We shift them even further apart, and now we have again pi phase difference. So therefore, the coupling strength can be estimated and uh, obtained from our, from, from, uh, from this expression by taking some ansatz, some form, of the condensate cloud, uh, delta here is, sigma here is the uh, inverse characteristic width of the pump, kc is the outflow wave number, d is the distance between two condensates, um, and, and, and that's the combination in terms of the Bessel functions, telling us that we can, by changing either the pumping parameters, the pumping intensity that influences kc, or the width of the pump, or the distance between two elements, we can change and we ha can have this interaction strength being positive, negative, and also changing the amplitude of the coupling strength. This is not the only tool we can use to change the interactions. Another one is polarization degree of freedom, because polaritons, being half light, half matter, inherit the light polarization. So we can talk about left and right circularly polarized polaritons. And here, for instance, when we have two polaritons, two condensates that have the same uh, polarization, they are anti-ferromagnetically coupled as witnessed by this minimum between them in this density profile configuration. 
uh, if we change the left spot from right circular polarized to left circular polarized, all of a sudden the interaction changed and we have in-phase configuration between, between the condensates. Okay, so what is the recipe for building polariton simulator? Now we have all necessary ingredients. So you tell me what is your favorite optimization problem. We map it into spin Hamiltonian. Mathematically, we know that it always can be done. And then arrange the uh, uh, map, the matrix elements of the spin Hamiltonian into coupling strands of our Hamiltonian. Arrange polaritons in a graph. Let polaritons condense, read out the phases, and we can do it very accurate by doing an interference measurement, um, expanding one condensate and superimposing on all the other. And then we uh, realize this, this idea in experiments, so what is shown here, so we, we, we've done, we followed the trend of other systems, say ultra-cold VCs and other systems, when they simply show first how the spins can be realized for a simple unit lattice, triangular, square, hexagonal, cadome, etc. Here I just show some examples. So these are experimental profiles on the density of the, of the uh, ground state configuration. So this is the element of the triangular matrix, but I made it a uh, triangular lattice, but I made it more interesting by slightly um, shifting this, this element towards the center so that the symmetry is broken. This can be seen because the interference image has maybe one diagonal here and the two layers of um, fringes in here. But then we read out the phase, phase distribution that, and they minimize the XY, XY Hamiltonian. And this is what we have also from uh, mathematical modeling of these systems. Uh, similarly for uh, this directional coupling, we have anti-ferromagnetic coupling in this direction and then ferromagnetic coupling in this direction. And again, from this image, you can see that the phases of the condensate, this classical phases, arrange themselves uh, according to the minimum of the XY Hamiltonian. What is the beauty of this platform? That it's extremely easy to scale it up because it's really just a hologram on acting uh, together with the spatial light, it's a spatial light modulator by which we can create these polaritons in any geometry we want and with any intensities we want. So we show the scalability, for instance, on these images, of realizing 45 condensates and then changing the lattice parameter, the distance between the, the condensates. And the, um, the Fourier spectrum is shown here, uh, showing that this system is in, uh, all elements are um, anti-ferromagnetically coupled negative coupling, we change the distance slightly, then they now ferromagnetically coupled, we change it again, again, anti-ferromagnetically coupled, and from the, how crisp the, um, uh, the, bre uh, the bre uh, peaks are, we can see that indeed the entire system is in, in a coherent state. Okay, um, this is not the only thing that we can do. To, uh, to have the continuous wave excitation. We can also study the dynamical um, condensation. In this case, you see the lattice of 100 condensates that first arrange themselves ferromagnetically, then reconfigure and become antiferromagnetically and ferromagnetically coupled again as the pumping intensity decreases. So these are pulsed excitation. You created this excitone reservoir, or these 100 exciton reservoirs for 100 condensates, they start scattering into the condensates, but as we do not replenish the hot reservoir, the pumping intensity becomes lower and lower and lower, so what you, therefore the system goes between ferro and antiferromagnetic states because of different, different pumping intensities. Okay, so the main principle, so I would like to again, to. Uh, to give this big picture. So what we're trying to do is the whole process is that we start with your favorite optimization problem. Travel salesman, graph coloring, partitioning, max cut, whatever, uh, phase retrieval. We map it into the spin Hamiltonian, either XY Hamiltonian if the spins, this, uh, these phases are continuously mapped between zero and two pi. It could be, I think, it, it, if we restrict the phases to be uh, zero and pi, it could be clock or pots model if um, the states are more than, more than two. 
And we know that this is, can be done. And in this paper, for instance, Andrew Lucas showed the explicit mapping on all these famous 21 car problems into the spin Hamiltonian, Ising Hamiltonian in this case. And then we would like to create the network of so-called coherent centers. It could be polariton condensate, it could be laser, it could be OPO. And then, so, but, but elements that can be represented by a single complex number that has an amplitude and a phase. And then we populate them from below until something happens. In our case, condensation happens, or so laser coherence happened. And then read out the uh, phase differences, and this is the answer that we map back into the answer of our optimization problem. OK, but let me now formulate the mathematic of this process, because why we can use this idea and represent perhaps the general scheme for many non-equilibrium systems to attain the same thing, the global minimum of the spin Hamiltonian. So what are the requirements for this to work? So I can write down the dynamics, the evolution of these complex numbers, putting the important ingredients. So first of all, I have to have the gain. So this is my control parameter that I take from below. They have to be losses because it's a non-equilibrium system. And the losses should be linear and non-linear in order to have gain saturation, in order to reach the steady state. Then I may or may not have some self-interactions in my polariton system. I have in lasers, perhaps I, perhaps I don't. And then I have the coupling term that couples the i's with j's with the strength j i j. And plus, I have noise inherent to any that present in any system. If I simply had a single condensate and I brought the gain to some threshold value, there is a supercritical Hopf bifurcation. When at first I have zero, I have no occupation of this, of this mode. And then there is, there is something dramatic happens again, and this mode becomes occupied. But let me, uh, let me look at the um, fixed points of the system. So if I plug this in, separate real and imaginary parts, then the fixed point, if it exists, gives me the densities of, of each coherent center in this form, and I will write down, the I will keep the dynamical evolution of the, of the phase untouched. As you can hear, and as you can see here, this is Kuramoto network, known in, uh, in uh, synchronization phenomena, for instance. And it looks like the gradient descent to the minimum of the XY Hamiltonian, except for one annoying feature, that it has this term which depends on the densities that I do not a priori know until I actually found the fixed point. That's not good. I don't want to solve the problem for which I don't know actually the coefficients before I actually solved it. This is, this is rather useless, I have to admit. So, but what can I do with that? What I need to do is to actually bring all the occupation to a threshold value, to the number that I postulated from, from initially. In my polariton condensates, what we do is during this evolution, as we ramp up the pumping power from time to time, we decrease the pumping power for those modes that have lower densities and decrease for those that have high densities and increase for those that have lower density, again, by reconfiguring the spatial light modulator for that. But this is the key ingredient, and it has to be done. It's essential for all the gain dissipative system. This has to be done for opios, for lasers, for every system that has this description. And if we do that, then if we now go back to the fixed point, and now I will write down the total mass. So I have n lattice side, n coherent centers. That previously I have each has occupation by i. So now with this control, when I drive all of my amplitude to the threshold value, these become that now I have the total mass that I know before I started this evolution. But now I have to change, so now I have to adjust the pumping rate individually for each of the nodes. But now because I, I brought all of my density to the same value, now these terms don't contribute. And as you can see in my Kuramoto oscillator, now I'm guaranteed that I have coherent state 
because this is frequency is the same for all my oscillators. So now I have a system that guaranteed to find the, uh, the minimum, at least the local minimum, because this is the gradient descent to the minimum of the XY Hamiltonian. And at the same time, I arranged it in such a way that I know this before, beforehand. I know this beforehand, but I'm always choosing the total pumping injection rate to be minimum. If this is always at the minimum, then this term is always at the maximum. And therefore, I'm reaching the global minimum of the XY Hamiltonian, not the local one, because the way I select my injections always from, from below. OK, but if this is true, then I should be able to formulate this quantum-inspired algorithm. So if I do it mathematically on my classical computer, I should be able to find the global minimum as well. And we actually, we've checked that, and here I give you just one picture illustrating how we evolve these two equations for 100 modes, all coupled with all the rest with uh, random, with random couplings. And we, we tested on other, other more sparse matrices as well, and we compared it with uh, bayesian hopian algorithm, a modification of the simulated, um, simulated annealing. And not only the minimum, of the XY Hamiltonian agrees to like 10 significant digits, but as you can see the result, the minimizers themselves are in agreement. So we indeed, by, involving this, by evolving this dynamical system, the system finds, finds its global, the global minimum. Okay, but so far, I haven't actually discussed the actual mathematics, the modeling, beyond the polariton condensates. I only use some general description of maximizing the number of particles or the principle of its operation being the gain dissipative system. So the model that uh, proved to be very efficient for describing these systems, uh, describing these processes in this two-stage stage system, is that we have the equations, the Ginsburg-Landau equation on the wave function of the condensate, coupled to the rate equation on the density of the hot exciton reservoir. So I will start with the, hot reser uh, with the reservoir given by density, this nr. So there are losses, linear losses in the reservoir, and losses because the particles relax and feed the condensate with the scattering rate represented by this parameter. And we have a CW experiment or pump excitation, so we have, we pump, we replenish the reservoir with the pumping rate given P. For the condensate itself, we have the usual equation up to this term, which is gross pitayevsky We have kinetic energy. We have the term that is responsible for energy relaxation. This term also present when we trying to um, describe ultra-cold BCs and their interaction with thermal particles, so this is the redistribution of the energy dissipation due to energy uh, redistribution and relaxation with hot exciton reservoirs. Um, we have polariton-polariton interactions. We also have the repulsive interactions with the reservoir that acts as the kind of external potential to the particles, increasing their kinetic energy as they propagate from the place where they were created. Plus, for the Ginsburg-Landau part, we have the gain, which is the scattering from the reservoir, and we have linear, we have linear losses. So this model uh, describes, describes a huge variety of various experiments and is quite, uh, quite successful in that. So then we use the, uh, the tight binding approximation. We eliminate the spatial degrees of freedom. Assuming that the condensate, the pump, and the reservoir is simply the sum, the linear superposition, in this case of the wave functions of the single, uh, single condensate. Here we have the pump, which is the sum of the Gaussian pumps, and the reservoir is also, um, also can be uh, separated in terms of the time-dependent part and the um, spatial, spatial part. And then we integrate the spatial degrees of freedom, and it turns out that, um, and by the way, I have to note is that we have a huge flexibility in controlling all these parameters. 
because we can make, by using the de different detuning, we can make our polariton more photon-like or more exciton-like. We can change the effective mass. We can change this, uh, th this interaction strength again by doing that and also by having trapped condensate, create them in one position and then, um, and then create so that they flow and actually become the condensate away from the, from the hot exciton. We can change, we can tune the polariton, polariton interactions. Uh, we can change the, the, the losses again by either using lithography to create even change the losses even in, uh, in different parts of the spectrum. We can introduce the protons also to change um, uh, these parameters in the system, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these parameters can take very different values. For instance, in terms of the losses of the condensate, in our experiments, as I mentioned, it's 5 to 10 picosecond. By simply growing the number, the layers of Bragg reflectors, we can increase the lifetime to two orders of magnitude, make them 200 picoseconds, etc. So, depending, therefore, on different parameters, I can use, I can get the different regimes also studied in the theory of various coupled oscillators and lasers, etc., and the synchronization. For instance, if I only neglect the nonlinear self interactions, my system will uh, take the form of Lan Kobayashi system. If I use the fast reservoir relaxation limit, so I will assume that the lifetime of the condensate is much larger than the lifetime of the reservoir particles at a particular level, then uh, I can also do density adjustments uh, or without density adjustments, and then again I have different, different. Um, system, different system of oscillators. So if I, under the fast uh, reservoir relaxation limit and density adjustments, I have, again, the Kuramoto, Kuramoto model. When I have an XY model and the self, uh, and the, um, and the Kuramoto system in this case will always give me the global minimum. That's what we discussed before. Or I can keep my reservoir and the interaction with the reservoir, and then I have so-called so uh, Sakaguchi-Kuramoto model, or if I don't do the density adjustment, this is the stuart landau model, etc. Okay. Just one slide on what it gives me, because now within a single system, I can have a hybrid lattices when some parts of the system belong to one class and other parts of the system belong to a different, different class, even if I pump all my condensates with the same pumping intensity, because the links on the border, um, the condensate on the border have the particle exchange with a fewer number of neighbors, it's like I combine the Kuramoto oscillators with the Stuart landau oscillators. And in this case, I can have, for this lattice, for instance, the large scale oscillations where the mass travels through the system in a macroscopic manner on the order of uh, up to 10 gigahertz. Uh, one thing to mention about polaritons that they are very fast particles. They travel at 1% of speed of light, one micron per picosecond. Uh, and we can have other, other regimes also studied in, uh, in, uh, in, in various oscillators. So, but for analog spin Hamiltonian optimizer, indeed I have to meet quite a few constraints on the, uh, on the, so I need to devise my lattice, to devise my parameters in my system so that various, um, various um, conditions are met. I discussed some of them. So we have to have a particular type of coupling. We should not have kind of the Josephson coupling, so this interaction potential between polariton and exciton should be very small. The um, coupling should be self-adjoint, and that's what we have in our system because this is the real term and the part that depends on the pumping intensities. We have to complement our system to do density adjustments from time to time, and with this, we know that the system reaches the global minimum of the XY Hamiltonian. But there is one more caveat that I have to mention because you notice here that my couplings actually depend on the pumping strength that I, again, don't a priori know, right? Because I choose those in order to bring all the occupation, all the um, densities of my condensate to the same value. 
but I can separate them always from the geometric and pump parameters, pump, geometrical pump parameters. And therefore, I also, from time to time, I need to adjust the coupling through the same mechanism. I have to change this term in such a way with this new injection rates, its approaches to the coefficients that define the problem that I'm solving. And this little uh, diagram also gives the representation how it's been done. So this is experimental image that I showed before. Even from the density distribution, you can see that there is no density adjustment yet because they have different densities uh, at the boundary of this condensate. So first, if we adjust, and the phases, therefore, are not what we expect. They all, this is kind of spin gloss. So if we adjust the pumping, so now we start, for instance, this is, sorry, it's not clearly visible. It's about 50% to be pumped more in the corners than we pump in the center. In this case, we have a better configuration, almost anti-ferromagnetically aligned, although there are still not the perfect spins here. And now we change K, and now we move these two layers and this is even further, uh, uh, like 12% away, and now we have equal densities and uh, f uh, perfect, uh, perfectly pi phase difference between, between the condensates. Um, one slide on how to do Ising. In our experiments, we do that because we can combine non-resonant pump with pumping resonantly. And if we pump at resonance one, this is just an external field, if we pump with resonance two, in our XY Hamiltonian, we introduce the penalty for the spins to be deviating from zero in pi. That implements Ising. If we can, um, so this is already within experimental reach. Pumping at high N is hard, but if we will manage to pump, we haven't done it yet, if we manage to pump at resonance three, we can implement the three state Quartz model. And that's uh, what the um, theory tells us, that that then gives us, the course, the correct configuration for the spins. Uh, and let me spend the last two minutes. Um, the holy gray, or grail of what we're trying to do is to be able to create this lattice of the condensates, but then being able to change without playing with geometry. Because of course, if I just play with geometry, I don't have much flexibility with the three Condensates, you can establish any strength to have the fourth couple to all three of those with arbitrary strengths. It's not possible in 2D geometry. So instead, we would like to have a fixed 2D geometry, like square grid, and then being able to change the coupling between any two condensates without affecting the rest. rest. This hasn't been achieved in other system um, accurately, at least to the, as far as I know. But in this case, we propose the scheme of how to use the dissipation. So the lighter color corresponds to the larger dissipation. Uh, so these blocks are needed to prevent the condensates on the diagonal from talking. And then there are these channels where we can change the dissipation dynamically by introducing biexitones. So this is a combination of lithography and the dynamical introduction of biexitones where we need to make this change. And the spins align correspondingly. And just to the last picture, so for instance, this is 25 by 25 lattice where we establish the links in such a way that at the ground state we recover these two letters, staying for Skoltec, but any uh, ex other excited state, actually, you can't see, uh, you can't see um, that these letters were even, even encoded there. But so this image was created dynamically. So again, ramping up from, from the zero. Okay, I think I should stop. So what I uh, try to tell you is that now we have this, for us, very exciting system. I think it has many advantages uh, in comparison with other quantum or classical analog simulators for finding the global state of uh, a given spin, spin model. And then I took you through the steps that we have achieved already or what we still, what we are working on now uh, to really be able to solve these this hard problems. And as a side note, differential equations that we derived while looking at this principle of gain dissipative system also led to some, perhaps, hopeful uh, classical, classical algorithms, kind of quantum-inspired classical algorithm. Okay, thank you, and I'm open to questions.
simulation. Your, your entire simulation is, of course, of classical uh, equations. No, it was no, no. It, uh, I showed the actual experiments. So this was simulation part. The rest was uh, the actual experiments. No, but my uh, but my point is, your equations are referring to classical quantities, not yes. as as you said. Are th but your s ultimate system of polaritons is quantum mechanical. Do any of the sort of quantum mechanical underlying effects have anything to do with your experiment, or are they so far away that you don't have to worry about them? Yes, this is an excellent question, and this is to the core of actually the process by which the system finds its global minimum. Because of course, when the condensate is created, it's semi-classical, it's a classical system. But during the condensate uh, formation, this is where we have the quantum quantum mechanics at its play. So we hope, because the key mechanism for achieving the global minimum is for the system to span possible phase configurations before the condensation takes place. And being a quantum, we hope that's, that's where the entanglement, the uh, superposition will help the system to actually span more various phase configuration before the condensate is achieved. We have any other questions? Sure. Sorry. Can you give a uh, little more uh, global perspective on the optimization question? Um, to be precise, in order for this to be a uh, to be competitive with other optimizations, uh, essentially, how big do I have to make it? How many condensates do I have to get? And what do I have to do in the way of keeping them quantum mechanically coherent and so on? Mm -hmm. Yes. Again, this is very profound and very, um, you know, it's very, di very difficult to answer short. You know, this, this question is at the core of any, any system, right? So let me just tell you what, uh, what we know, right? So first of all, we know that any hard problem any NP hard problem can be mapped into 2D Ising with magnetic fields where only on a square grid when only next neighbor interactions happening. You know, you don't have to couple everything with everything. Just neighbors interaction. However, the price you pay, you have to be able to establish the coupling to the infinite precision. That for actual, for real system, you wouldn't be able to do. So you need to reach some balance. So you don't have just next neighbor interaction. You can perhaps go to next neighbor, ne uh, nearest neighbor, not just nearest neighbor interaction, but next neighbor interactions, and therefore remove some of the precision that you required uh, between, between the nodes. So there is no mathematical fact that tells us, for instance, if you have two six significant digits, then it's still NP hard problem. We simply, we simply don't have it. So hopefully, you know, this is, this is one thing that I wish we would have. You know, how many, what is the precision of the coupling that still for the next neighbor interactions gives me the NP hard problem? We simply don't know. On another hand, um, so this is, so we either try to have more than just next neighbor connections or ideally couple everything with everything, or we try to make the precision with which we couple the, the, the next neighbor. So this is, this is one, but we don't know to which extent we need to go, to go in this. Um, on, the, on the other hand, talking about polar process of condensation takes place in a matter of because the University of Strathclyde in Scotland, so We've moved a little bit north. Body physics um, by taking highly controllable systems, especially um, cold atoms, but also trapped ions or um, polar molecules, for example, and uh, controlling them in particular with, um, with light and magnetic fields in such a way as to realize models that initially you might have associated more with strongly interacting electrons in solid state physics. So sort of the paradigmatic example here is if you take cold neutral atoms and you put them in standing waves of laser light, you can make um, Hubbard models 
um, where you understand that this is really the, the microscopic model under well-controlled approximations. Um, we have sort of systems where you have large length scales and slow time scales, which allows you to look at these systems, track dynamics in real time, also to really go and image things on the scale sort of of a single lattice site or, or of single atoms. Um, and so it gives you a whole lot of measurement opportunities and opportunities to control the system that um, you might not have in sort of uh, analogous systems in um, solid state physics. It just gives you a very different sort of parameter regime uh, to go and study this type of physics. Um, and this is nice because it allows you to study both sort of the thermodynamics of these systems and also out of equilibrium dynamics. Um, but what I want to focus on today is the fact that if you take sort of slight variants of these things, especially sort of chains of trapped ions where you can have